Uh, thank you all for coming here. Uh, I don't know how to give a, a formal talk or presentation, so I do my best to be formal, but uh, we are very honored to have Dr. McGough here. Uh, he is, I call him, the father of memory consolidation. Uh, he did his PhD in psychology from University of Berkeley, uh, a postdoc with Daniel Bovet in uh, a Nobel laureate from Rome. And then later on, he moved to University of California, Irvine, to found a center for memory and neurobiology when he was 32 years old. That was the, the first center on its own in the world, actually. Uh, and after that, uh, from 1982 for 22 years, he founded the Center for Learning and Memory in University of California, Irvine. Dr. McGough. Uh, is a member of National Academy of Art and Science in the US and also a member of National Science in Brazil and Mexico. He has been for 57 years an active scientist. And during that time, he published 560 papers. So based on calculation, I mean he published one paper per month. Uh, again, as I said, he's the father of memory consolidations, but also he's the first one who started uh, a very rare, almost science fiction people that they have highly superior memory. So we are glad to hear his new research on this subject. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. <clears throat> I, I thank you for coming today. And I thank the re people who are responsible for bringing me here today. And I have an opportunity to tell some of you the story for the first time. And some of you, are go you're going to get a bit of a story that you've already heard a couple of days ago. And I'm not going to apologize because repetition is very good for memory. <laughs> and so if you hear part of the same story twice, it's even better. And so don't say, oh, he said that before. I know all about it. Uh, it's just good for you. So it's, it's like taking medicine you don't like. It makes you healthy and well. And that's what I'm trying to do here. So you see the title up there. That's what I want to talk about. That's not how I got started in life. I got started in life by uh, investigating the neurochemistry of memory. And in order to do that, I started investigating the influence of drugs on memory, stimulant drugs. And that got me into studies of memory and got me into studies of what's going on in the nervous system. And as you'll see, my story segued from that into uh, more the neurobiology of memory particularly the conditions that create strong memory. So here's a, a very important question that was proposed by the most famous psychology in our history, and that was William James at Harvard University. And he said, why do we remember so little? That is, we, we have experiences all the time, and yet we remember little of all the experiences that we do have. Why is that? And the other question that he raised is, Despite the fact that we remember so little, why do some of our experiences leave lasting memories? So this was a question that he proposed in 1890 in his very famous book. And uh, with my uh, youth and inexperience many years ago, I decided to tackle these questions, uh, assuming that, uh, I could, uh, that I had the honor of pursuing a question that was raised by the famous uh, psychologist, philosopher, William James. Now, the clue, the clue to an answer to both of these questions that were raised by William James uh, comes from Francis Bacon in 1620. And I, I want us to think about it for a second. He said, memory is assisted by anything that makes an impression on a powerful passion, inspiring fear, for example, or wonder, shame, or joy. Now, there are two assumptions in here. One is that memory is weak to begin with because it says memory is assisted. Memory can only be assisted if it's not very strong. So it, it takes care of, or it responds to an issue that William James raised previously, but it, it suggests that, uh, that the passion, or we'll substitute emotional arousal, plays some role in providing an opportunity for some memories that would otherwise be weak to become strong. 
So there are two things in this that speak to the William James concern or questions that he raised. So what does it mean to say that passion, powerful passion, well I interpret that to mean emotional arousal and the physiological consequences of emotional arousal which leads to activation of the brain and then you follow the pathway down. Uh, on one side you get release of epinephrine from the adrenal medulla and on the other side you get the release, the, the synthesis and subsequent release of cortisol uh, from the adrenal cortex and both of these go into the bloodstream and it's something over which you have no control at all. So if you are excited right now, if you should get excited about something, the adrenaline will increase and you start the synthesis of cortisol, a half an hour later both of them will be high and you have no control over that. This is an automatic physiological response to the conditions that you are exposed to in life. It just goes on. Now the question is, is Bacon right that the turning on these physiological responses have something to do with the creation of a strong memory? That was his assertion back in 1620. I've just translated it into physiological terms, so let's take a look. So to investigate this many years ago, I started using this task right now which I call inhibitory avoidance. It's a very simple task. Uh, remember, I'm interested in the, the strong experience, uh, strong memories of a unique experience. That's what I'm interested in. So in order to do that, I have to have a unique experience. So I take a rat that has been living in a cage, doing nothing but I suppose using its imagination or whatever for approximately two months. I take it out of the cage, bring it in here, and put it in the white part of the apparatus which I can't see and you can, right here. So the rat is just sitting there. We open a door, a door slides uh, uh, down, and the rat can explore and go out into the other part of the apparatus. When it meets, reaches the middle part of the gray region, that's a metal, metal floor, when it reaches there, it gets a mild electrical shock to its feet. That is it. That is the experiment. Walk through, get a shock to its feet, we take the animal out, the next day put the animal back in the white area and simply ask, would you like to go back into the other region? And we measure the time that the animal spends in the starting chamber before it goes back in. Uh, and we determined that if an animal has no memory, the animal will walk right through. If the animal has good memory, the animal will stay out for a minute or two minutes or even ten minutes depending upon the condition and demonstrate that it remembers what happened the previous day. So, here's a, an experiment to investigate the influence of a hormone that we release to ourselves when we get excited. And in this case, we gave it to the rat an, an amount which would be equivalent to that that is produced by a very high foot shock. But the animal gets a low foot shock. We just give it a big dose of adrenaline or epinephrine. So their controls are shown on the left in the white. And these controls stayed out uh, when put back in for about a minute. The first day they walk through in about five or ten seconds. The next day they stay out for a minute and we infer that they stay out because they remember having been in and received the shock. We have controls we use to make sure that is the case. Now the question is what happens if we give immediately after the training trial at a time that the animal would release epinephrine to itself if it were a high foot shock, but if we supply the epinephrine, will the animal remember better? Now, think about yourself. If, if I were to give you, if I were to say something very exciting to you right now, frightening for example, uh, would you remember what happened more than if I didn't do that? Well this is like the rat except we supply the excitement directly uh, with a needle and we give a lot of epinephrine and we see what happens. Well what happens is those animals don't go back in for four minutes. They got the same training. The only, thing, only difference was that immediately after training they got a dose of epinephrine. That's all that happened after the training. Then we can ask, well does it have to be immediately after the training? Well yes for a big effect because if we delayed the injection, the longer the delay of the injection after the learning, the less the effect. 
So this is a, 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 the first ever, but also a clear demonstration that epinephrine enhances the memory of an experience that just occurred. And of course, that's the way it works, works in real life. You don't re release epinephrine before something exciting happens, you release it after it happens. And so we modeled that in the experiment, give it a mildly exciting experience and then have the animal remember it as a terribly exciting experience just by a little dose of epinephrine. Now, we decided to look at the, the place or places in the brain that might be involved in enabling this influence that we had uh, just observed. And we chose to look at the amygdala. This was many years ago. And we chose to look at the amygdala because in other work, we had accidentally found that if we stimulated the amygdala electrically after an animal learned something, we could enhance memory. It was just a pure accidental finding. But we said if that's the case, maybe the amygdala would be a region of the brain which would be important in mediating the influence that we had just seen. So we did experiments in which we first implanted animals with a, um, a cannula aimed down at the specific region of the amygdala, the basolateral region, a subdivision of the amygdala. And the cannula is sitting there so that when we trained the animal, uh, immediately after we trained the animal, we could inject the basolateral amygdala with a little bit, in this case, not of epinephrine, but norepinephrine, because epinephrine doesn't pass the blood-brain barrier, but we knew that epinephrine turns on the release of norepinephrine. So we said the candidate here might be norepinephrine in the amygdala. So we did that experiment. And here is the result. First, we replicated the earlier experiment. Uh, these are animals that stayed out for almost two minutes. That's the white bar there in their memory. And now we see what happens once again with epinephrine. Huge enhancement of memory given by a post-training injection of uh, epinephrine. Now another group was given a very low dose of the beta adrenergic antagonist, that is a blocker of epinephrine and norepinephrine, a very low dose, and that didn't do anything. This injection is into the amygdala, into the amygdala. But what happens with that dose injected into the amygdala when we uh, gave epinephrine in the periphery, the effect was blocked. So this gave us our first clue that the, the action of peripheral epinephrine in influencing the storage of memory involved in some way this region of the brain, the amygdala. And so we pursued that in a really a great many experiments. So I'm going to show you just um, to show you the, the limits of this, I'll show you one task um, which I rather like because it doesn't involve any shock. It's much more like our personal experiences of just going through daily life. So here is a rat going through daily life, goes in a box, and there are two objects that look just alike. And we study what the animal does in there, and it turns out the animals explore the objects, but they spend equal amounts of time on the two objects. Boring. I mean, what could be less exciting than to be locked into a box with two light bulbs, right? So, on the um, next day, we put them in the box, and it has one of the same kind of objects and another object that's different. And we ask, where does the animal spend its time? And the animal spends its time on the object it has not seen before. So it's a very nice test of memory that's built on the rat's curiosity. It's clearly, it's a memory test. What other interpretation there could there be that the animal selects the object it hasn't seen? There's no shock in here at all. Now we ask the question, can we make a strong memory of this event where there is very little emotional arousal involved? Can we turn it on? So we gave a training with very minimal experience in the box on the first day, and you can see that over here it was so little that there isn't any significant evidence of memory. However, if we followed that exposure, with a dose of norepinephrine in the amygdala, then we had huge enhancement of memory that was dose dependent. Enhanced memory of something as boring as looking at objects. So we can make a strong memory of something which by itself did not elicit 
strong emotion simply by this kind of injection procedure. And on, on the other side, you see that we can block the memory over here by injections of propranolol. So here's good memory and poor retention if we put into the basal lateral amygdala, we put some propranolol. So the, the learning itself does not have to be exciting. The learning can be pretty boring. And we can turn a memory of a boring experience into a very strong memory by manipulating the system which ordinarily regulates the strength of memory for exciting experiences. We can gain experimental control over that. And that gives us an increased evidence that this region of the brain is in control of regulating how strong our memories will be of various experiences that we have. Now, all of this presumes that um, norepinephrine is in fact released in the amygdala. I mean, up until now, what I've shown you is that we can, we can influence by injecting it. But what about the normal release? Well, let's take a look at this. This is the, the release, norepinephrine release in this region of the brain that we measure using uh, high performance liquid chromatography. What we do is we put a probe down in there and that probe samples the solution which is being released within this region of the brain. We analyze that for norepinephrine. So if you look at, the, um, look at what's going on here, these are resting conditions. These are individual animals that are just resting. And you can see this is the base level here. And at this point, they get trained in the inhibitory avoidance task. They're put in and they get a shock. And then what you see is the increase in the release of norepinephrine induced by that at various times afterwards, and these are all individual animals. So here's an animal with a huge increase in, in norepinephrine in the amygdala, and here in between, in between, and here's an animal that showed no, hardly any increase at all. So there's wide variability. And now we can ask the question, does, what does that have to do with memory? And to answer that, what you do is to look at the numbers up there. The numbers are the latency to re-enter the, the place in the box where they had received the shock. So the animal that has the highest release of norepinephrine never went back to the place where it received the shock. Never. We stayed out for 10 minutes, and that's when we stopped measuring. And that's not when I stopped measuring. That's when the graduate students and postdoc stopped measuring because they're bored watching animals do nothing. If you look at the lowest here, this animal walked through in 10 seconds. And what you see then is a relationship between the amount of norepinephrine released and the retention for performance te tested the next day. The more norepinephrine is released, the less likely are they are to go back uh, where they got the shock. So yes, norepinephrine is released under emotionally exciting experiences, number one. And two, it predicts retention behavior does both of those things. Now, we, uh, we think, as I have been implying all along with the examples I've given you, we think that this uh, applies to humans as well. This is not just rat work, but it's using rat work to get some principles, which we think will apply to us as well. So we've tried to figure out some experiments that we could do which would relate to this issue, or maybe even support the conclusions that we're, I'm trying to explain to you. And so I'll show you just a couple of these to illustrate the principle. Here's one experiment. So we, um, we told human subjects a, a story. And I'm showing you right here the memory for different phases of the story. Here's the story, it goes like this, and for everything I say, there is a picture that illustrates it. So a boy and a mother leave their house, there's a picture. They cross the street, picture. They see a car that has damage, picture, so on. They go to the hospital and they see it's a disaster preparedness day and so they see people wrapped up as though they've had injuries and then the mother makes a telephone call and goes home. Picture, picture, picture. And we test them then two weeks later for their memory of these pictures and what you see is uh, there are three phases of the story, the beginning, the middle, and the end, and they remember all of it equally well. Another group saw the same pictures, but with a different story. 
boy and a mother leave home, they cross the street, the boy is hit by a car, rushed to the hospital, surgeons work frantically to save his life, a distraught mother makes a telephone call and goes home. Same pictures, and then two weeks later they are tested for memory of the picture, and that's what their memory is in red up there, and the middle of part of the story is the emotional part of the story, and that's what they remember. So emotional arousal increases the memory in the human subjects for this period. So then we did the same thing and we said, what if we give propranolol, that is a beta adrenergic blocking agent, to the human subjects who are in this experiment? So um, uh, here is the percent uh, correct on the left for the neutral story in subjects and on the right is the percent correct for the arousal story. So this is a replication of our earlier finding. If they got the arousal story, they remember it better. What happens if they're given propranolol? It does nothing to the neutral story, but it blocks the enhancement that is induced by the exciting story. So we can turn a memory of an exciting event into an average mem memory rather than a strong memory simply by giving propranolol which blocks beta adrenergic activation. So the data, although they're different kinds of experiments, the results are the same. We also did experiments in which we trained human subjects and injected the, them with epinephrine and we got facilitation as we did with the rats. We had to stop those experiments because the human subject committee required that we tell our potential subjects, you must understand that there is a very slight possibility that this injection may kill you. And so we had to stop those. It's not going to kill them, but that's what they said we had to do. So we quit those experiments. And um, we, we learned from, pharmacol from uh, uh, cardiologists, we learned that you can also uh, increase epinephrine release by putting your hand in a bucket of ice water. They do that routinely to check uh, cardiovascular conditions. So some of our experiments involve training human subjects uh, on material to be learned and then having them immerse their hand in a bucket of ice water afterwards and believe it or not, that enhanced memory. So there was a rumor on the Irvine campus that undergraduate students were going to buy buckets of ice to take to class. <laughs> This is another study done by Larry Cahill, my former student, in which they simply uh, showed um, uh, uh, emotional pictures to human subjects. That's all they did. They looked at emotionally arousing pictures. And then afterwards, they got samples of saliva so that they could measure alpha amylase, which is an indirect measure of norepinephrine release. And what you're looking at is the correlation between a sal salivary alpha amylase that's measured immediately after learning and retention uh, uh, that was assessed one week later. And as you can see, there's a pretty good relationship. It's not perfect, but the correlation is uh, plus 7.2, which is not bad. It says that the alpha amylase measure is a predictor of retention of memory uh, assessed one week later. And of course, the findings are consistent with the animal research, even though they are different kinds of experiments. And then finally, on, on this series, um, we uh, also did PET imaging to assess the effect of emotional arousal. And in this condition, we injected um, subjects with uh, radio-labeled glucose, and then we put them in a room and had them watch some emotionally arousing film clips. And then we put them in a scanner and a, a PET scanner and measured the activation of the amygdala um, and, and uh, whoops, I don't, I don't show that. The amygdala gets activated when that's done and um, they got a surprise memory test three weeks later and you're looking at the relationship between the PET score which is at the bottom and the number of films recalled which is uh, going up the side there and the correlation is plus 0.93. It says, we can predict performance on the memory test several weeks after subjects are exposed to the, these movies simply by looking at the uh, PET image scores. Very, very strong predictor, uh, extremely strong predictor. 
So here's a cartoon which summarizes this part of the talk of what we think we have found. You have a learning experience, and this learning experience is going to activate the storage processes going on in a lot of different brain regions, that storage that underlies the representation of the memories that are initiated by the learning experience. At the same time, it's going to initiate um, contact with all of those regions of the brain. It's going to turn on the basolateral amygdala and it's going to turn off the adrenal glands for both cortisol and for, from epinephrine. If those are turned on, those are modulatory influences coming from the basolateral middle amygdala and the adrenal gland, and those modulatory influence will come up and influence the storage that's taking place in other regions of the brain where the memory is being processed. So that's our interpretation of the influence of epinephrine, cortisol, and the involvement of the basolateral amygdala because they work through that. And that's the way we look at it. Now, back to um, earlier thinking, uh, I showed you what Bacon had to say about this. Thirty years later, Descartes said, the usefulness of all of the passion consisting in their strengthening and prolonging in the soul thoughts which are good for it to conserve. So the importance of um, emotional excitement uh, consists in its strengthening memories which are good to conserve. And he knew that in 1650, and I did not know that when we started this research. As a matter of fact, I'm embarrassed about it because I should have known what philosophers thought about this, and uh, what I did was simply work on a problem that they'd drawn a conclusion to a long time ago. They said, ah, memories are good for, uh, you make strong memories if you have uh, emotional excitement. That's what both of them said. And all I did was to get some data which support that in the rat and the human and uh, provide some additional information about what it means to get excited. It's emotional arousal and it's a release of cortisol and epinephrine and it influences a particular region of the brain which is the basolateral amygdala which is in communication with all of the rest of the brain. So I think we provided a little bit of information that was not available to Bacon and Descartes. Now, I'm going to turn to the second part of, of this talk, and I would like to say that it fits beautifully with everything that I've already said. I can't say that because I don't know whether it does or not, but I'm going to tell you about it anyway. Um, it's, it happened this way. Um, Sixteen years ago, a woman sent me an email, and she said, I have a, a memory problem, and I want to see you. Now, what would you think if somebody told you they had a memory problem? You'd say, well, they're, they're not doing so well. Well, I, I said, this is not a memory clinic. I'll direct you to one. And she said, oh, no, no, it's not that kind of thing. She said, I don't forget. And it was a problem to her because she can remember every bad thing that has ever happened to her in life, and it was driving her nuts. And she wanted to learn about it. I think she wanted me to help her in some way, uh, assuming that I was a clinician, which I am not. So at any rate, I agreed to see her, and she came, and I'm going to tell you about her. And as we were investigating her, I was claiming this was the first individual in history ever identified to have this ability, and I learned that I was wrong, because there was a man who was identified in 1870 who claimed to have ability of being able not to forget, and he was tested and the results were published in a very obscure journal in 18, uh, a philosophical journal in 1870. I had never even heard of the journal, but somebody was kind enough, actually not kind enough, they sent it to me uh, with a bit of nastiness saying, you know, you were not the first after all, look at this study I found in the literature. Well, I, I was not offended, I thought it was wonderful to have <laughs> something to refer to. So, here is Daniel McCartney, age 54, tested in uh, June of 1870. Uh, this uh, person found the individual uh, and decided to test him. Now, he was tested many, many, many questions, many questions, and I've just uh, selected a few here just to illustrate uh, the point. And I want to draw your attention to two things. Uh, one is, uh, when asked a question, 
gave you details about what happened on a particular day. Um, and he responded very quickly. Two second latency between the question and the response. So he was asked, uh, 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 he, he was asked October 8th, 1828. And in two seconds he said it was Wednesday. It was cloudy and drizzled rain. I carried dinner to my father where he was getting out coal. Two seconds, all right? He claims that he remembered that. Here's another one, February 22nd, uh, 1829, the next year. To answer in two seconds. Saturday, it was cloudy in the morning and clear in the afternoon. There was a little snow on the ground. An uncle who lived near us uh, sold a horse beast that day for $35. So that was 41 years earlier. He remembers the day and he remembers something that happened on that day. Uh, April 4th, now this is now a shorter time. Uh, April 4th, 1841, three seconds. A long delay, three seconds. Sunday, it was rainy and muddy. General Harrison died that day. Then the next one, February, February 2nd, 1856. It was most awful cold. It was the coldest day I ever see in my life, he said. Now I checked the records for Iowa myself. I went into the records to see what it was. And the temperature records for Iowa indicate that February 4th was the coldest day in 1856. And that's two days away from the day in which he said it was the coldest day. Uh, and so on. Now, here, here's what the issue is. He responds very quickly, and so we assume that he has very good retrieval processes. Uh, we might assume that he has very good memory, but we have no way of validating most of the claims here. They sound perfectly reasonable, but we need validation. If he says that uh, it was cloudy and, and drizzled rain on, on, on October 28th, 1828, we can look and see if it rained, but we don't know whether his he took something to his father who was digging coal. We don't know that. So we have a validation problem. We have to take it pretty much at uh, face value. But I have to say that I checked several of these things, and several of them checked out. That is, there, there was another one uh, in which uh, he said it just rained terribly. So I checked the, the rain records for Iowa for that day, and I found that that was the rainiest season in a long time in, in, uh, in Iowa. So the little checking I did do tended to validate what he said, but that is a problem for understanding autobiographical memory. You need to be able to validate it in some way if you really think it is really remembering what actually happened. And that's the sense in which I'm interested in it. All right, I didn't know this when this uh, young woman came to, to see me. Um, I didn't know anything about it, so I just improvised my own method of examining her. I had gotten for Christmas, remember this is 2000, the turn of the millennium, so I'd gotten a big book that had a day-by-day -day, uh, newspaper clipping, uh, clippings of articles of each day of the preceding century. So I was able to look at um, um, events that occurred in the 1970s, 80s, and 90s. This woman was 34 years old, so I could go back uh, uh, some years to do some testing, and I would just open the book and find something on the book that would have been on CNN or uh, front page newspaper, magazine, something. Everybody would know about it. Everybody would have been exposed to it, and I would ask her about it. Um, I'll show you a couple of examples here. Uh, so I asked, uh, her name was Jill Price, I asked her, um, there was a plane crash in San Diego, tell us about it. And her response was, well, September 25th, 1978, and that is, of course, accurate. Um, when did the Gulf War start? And she says correctly, oops, Wednesday, January 16th, 1901. How many of you heard about the O.J. Simpson trial? Any of you old enough to remember that? Um, when, the, when was the verdict rendered? And she said immediately, October 3rd, 1995, and then so on, so on, a large number. I'm just giving you some examples. So she could tell me the day and the date, and she told me very quickly, and it was more than that because for every one of these, there was a narrative. 
It wasn't a factoid. She said, oh yeah, that Simpson verdict, that was terrible because I was sitting with my family and we were so upset about it. And it, it's a story about, so she's not, she hasn't just remembered that it was uh, uh, October 3rd, 1995. She's telling me that she remembered where she was and what was going on. As a matter of fact, she's very loquacious. So I had to turn her off while I was testing because she wanted to tell me too much. So that's asking for an event. And her, her response was um, uh, uh, indicated uh, on the right. Now we turned around the other way and I gave dates. So what happened on August 16th, 1977, and she said Elvis Presley died, right? Just like that. And her latency is about two seconds, very, very similar. And so on, you can see some of the, these things here. I tried to pick, as you will see, events that at least in California, West Coast of the United States, everybody would know about. Now my favorite here is the uh, third one down. Uh, I asked her what happened, um, actually I asked her what happened on November 7th, 1979, because I was looking at a newspaper article and it said November 7th, 1979, and I asked her what happened, and she said nothing. And so I gave her a clue. I said, international. That was the kind of clue I would give. And she said, well, I can't think of anything, but she said, our, uh, our, uh, the uh, Iranians uh, took over the U.S. Embassy on November 4th, 1979. I said, well, you got the right thing, but you're off by three days. And she said, no, the book is wrong. <laughs> and uh, then I checked and I found that I was looking at the date that the article was written and down in, in the article it gave the true date and she gave me the date on which the Iranians took over our embassy. Well, that got my attention because um, she could do that. So to stretch it a little bit, uh, I asked her to give me the dates of the last 22 Easter's. How many of you can remember the date of the last Easter? <laughs> and the, way, the year before, raise your hand if you remember. Well, she gave me uh, correctly all but one, all but one of the dates of the, of the last 22 Easter's and then she corrected it. She made a mistake on one and she corrected it. And she also, without asking, wrote down, because I asked her to write it down, she wrote down what she was doing on that day. Not only did she remember, and she's Jewish. So why would she care about Easter anyway? Interesting. So, um, raises a lot of questions. We had to ask um, if the, for the, for the public events, um, it's very clear she's right or wrong, and she was right generally. Um, when she wrote down her private events, there's no way of knowing whether she was right or wrong. So for her autobiographical memory, for the most part, we have to take her word for it. However, she kept a diary. And so we were able to spot check the diary for a number of her claims and look at it to see if they were correct. Now what's interesting about that, uh, she had kept diaries and she tied every one of them up, every, uh, diaries, the, the diaries, each one of them was about that thick. And then when she was finished with it, she would tie it up with a little pink ribbon, right? And she had a stack of these diaries, each one tied with a pink ribbon. So we had to dust them off <laughs> like that to get the dust off the diaries, open them up. And if she claimed that she did something on a particular day, we would find the day and check it out. And in every case, it turned out that we were able to validate her claims of things that had happened to her. Now, uh, she, uh, we, she, we treated her as uh, AJ because she didn't want to go public and then later on she decided to. So we appeared on a, on a radio station, public radio, and then she appeared on, briefly on a couple of television stations. Uh, and little by little we be began to accumulate subjects and by uh, 2010, we had accumulated um, uh, five very, very good uh, subjects. And we appeared, how many of you have heard of the, the US television program, 60 Minutes? Have you heard about it? Well, on the night that we uh, uh, appeared on that, 18 million people watched that program. 
And uh, of those 18 million, 600 of them and more uh, sent me an email within 10 minutes after that program claiming that they had the same ability. So then we had a potential pool of people. But I'm going to tell you about one of the people who was on that television program. Her name is Louise Owen. Uh, she is a professional violinist uh, in New York. She's a very good violinist, but uh, I don't think it's because she has good memory. It's because she started playing the violin when she was three years old, and her parents are both professional musicians. So I think she grew up in a musical environment, and a talent as well. So here's Louise Owen, and I want you to notice the, the speed of response and, and the uh, accuracy of the response. I hope you can hear this. McGaw says this type of memory is completely new to science, so he and his colleagues have had to devise their own tests, like this one on public events. October 19th, 1987. It's a Monday. Uh, that was the day the big stock market crash and the cellist Jacqueline Dupre died that day. The Berlin Wall falls on what day? Uh, November 9th, 1989, which was a Thursday. Christopher Reeves' accident occurred on what day? Uh, it was Saturday, May 27th, uh, 1995. And when were the Oscars held in 1999? In 1999. Sunday, March 21st. Yes. Perfect. What do you think? Uh, we deliberately ask about a lot of topics. Uh, Christopher Reeves, uh, we ask about the Berlin Wall, we ask about the Oscars. We try to cover a range of topics so that we can find out if they really knew what happened. And, and she knew, she knew. The other thing is, you see how quickly she responded? Now, if, if somebody asked me questions like that, if I even thought I might know, I would look at the ceiling let me see. I'll think about that. Yeah. Don't you do that? Somebody asks you a difficult question? The, the, I don't know why the ceiling is such a choice, but it is. They, well, the answer is up there. I see it. It's on the ceiling. She doesn't do that. Just, just very politely and friendly, she just gives the answer like that. Now, these are all factoids. These are all things that happen that I have a particular date. Um, uh, she was interested uh, when the cellist died. Uh, she knew that. She's a musician, but she also knew about Christopher Reeves, and she knew about everything that we asked there. Now, I think it's on the next one. I'll check a second here. Yeah. Um, on, on, on this one, uh, I ask her something which would not be a factoid. I, I, I ask her about um, a weather question. Let's move back in time now to uh, 1990. It rained on several days in January and February. Can you name the dates on which it rained? Mm. Um. <laughs> Believe it or not, she could. Let's see. It was slightly rainy and cloudy on January 14th, 15th. It was very hot the weekend of the 27th, 28th. No rain. We checked the official weather records. It rained very hard on Sunday, February 4th. And she was right. That was 20 years earlier, and she could tell me the days on which it rained in New York, where she lives, 20 years ago, and she was absolutely correct in that. So it's not just a factoid. It's not something which is a, a, a deep interest of hers. It's just she remembers uh, that, and we could validate it. So here is a, an autobiographical memory. Uh, the only fault there is that she did, she did close her eyes when she was looking it up. And I, we gave her, we took off points for that because. <laughs> um, we also, uh, by luck, have discovered some children who have this ability. And why is that important? It's important because some people may think that they have this ability just because they've acquired the ability as they have aged. They've learned more and more about how, what to do in order to retain memories. They develop some skills, learn the skill. So we started looking at children uh, because they would not have had either the time or the inclination to develop this. They're busy growing up. So uh, I'll show you some children whose parents claim that they have had this ability ever since they were young children. Unfortunately, we didn't get them until they were about eight years old, so they are elderly children uh, for our interests. And uh, I'll just let them speak for themselves. Housler, age 10. What day of the week was Halloween 2011? Monday. 
That one I didn't even have to think about. New Year's Day 2010. Uh, Friday. Friday. I remember that because I was up all night at the Blues game. <laughs> That's when Jake was six. He lives in St. Louis, loves sports, and he is, in most respects, a typical 10-year-old. What happened, related to school, on January 30th, 2013? That day, I'm pretty sure... Oh, wait. That's a trick question. We didn't have school that day. <laughs> there was a huge lightning storm that last night. We're like, hey, we didn't have school that day. How's your day? That was a trick question. So we didn't have school that day, and there was also was a lightning storm all night. So it's not a factoid talking about his life. Uh, I went to a blues game, I, all of that, and that's just, oh, the, the weather is like that. And, and, and the, you know, it's just, you ask him a question, it's not like somebody memorized it. It's, he apparently is recalling that day and then saying what has happened. And uh, he was six years old when that was first observed. Now. In addition, we've discovered a set of twins. So I'm going to show them to you. And I'll let you decide what you think. 7th, 2012. Do you know what day of the week that was? That was a Sunday. You're right. There is exactly one child in the world other than Jake who's yeah, been identified so far with this ability, 11-year-old Tyler Hickenbottom. And in a fortuitous coincidence, Tyler happens to be an identical twin. He and his brother Chad share the same genes. Yeah, I think I might have worn an orange shirt. But surprisingly, not the same memory. No, that was in 2012. How would you like to be his brother? Huh? Um, that was uh, 2010. I tested them again uh, just this summer, and uh, they're just like that. They're really good kids. They're just normal kids, and uh, just talking with them, there's no difference between the two. They're just identical twins, and they're a lot of fun. I test them individually, and the, and the one just answered correctly on every question, and the other one is, I don't even know what you're talking about. You know, <laughs> he's clueless, absolutely clueless. So it raises a question. They're identical twins. One of them has the ability, one of them does not. What does that mean? Now, in the course of this, I told you we, we, um, we were on this TV program uh, on uh, December 19, 2010, and it was a Sunday. <laughs> It happens, this program is always on a Sunday, so it's helpful, that's helpful. So it's on a, it's on a Sunday, and I didn't, see the, I didn't see the program because I was at a, as a, at a concert, but I recorded it, and, and I got back about three hours after the program had aired, and by the time I got back, I had over 600 emails from people who claimed that they had the same ability. We tested them all uh, either, um, uh, by Skype or just on the telephone, and we identified uh, people who responded well, and uh, we gave them a lot of tests. I'm going to show you something about the characteristics of these other people. All right, this is, I think, very interesting, at least it is to me. If you look at what colors are going to be there, yellow orange. Yellow orange are controls, and that is their performance on a 30 question quiz and it shows the percent um, correct and the number of people who get that percent. So you can see nobody gets over 35% correct in the orange. And uh, the, the modal uh, point is uh, 15. That's controls. These are people who do not claim to have the ability. If you look over uh, to the right then, you see that there are people who score 50% correct, all the way up to 75% correct. Now, the blue are people who are really very good, but if you follow that distribution, you see that as it goes left, all of a sudden the people who claim to have the ability look just like controls. So those are people who claim they have the ability, but in fact do not. That's these white ones here. Matter of fact, there's some people who claim to have the ability who are worse than controls over here, right? 
So we have two distributions, and the point I want to make here is that these people are not at the tail end of a normal distribution. They are a different distribution. They're a different distribution. They are different people. They are way uh, different on the scale. And we have worked primarily with the people who are marked in blue. And we brought them to the laboratory, and they got better than 55% correct on the questions that, that we asked. And I'll tell you a little bit about them. So first, we gave them a 10 dates quiz, and they are asked to provide for each of 10 dates, the day of the week, a verifiable event, something that happened around that period of time, and an autobiographical event. Now, the verifiable event means that we could check it to see if it really happened in the world, but we couldn't check the autobiographical. We had to take their word for it. And here are the results. Uh, in blue, we have the, what we call the potential, and HSAM is highly superior autobiographical memory. We call them the HSAMs. Look on the left, the day of the week, uh, the HSAMs were almost at 100%, and the uh, controls are down about 15%, which is, you know, what is uh, one-seventh? Uh, they're, they're probably less than, than, they probably guess wrong more often than, than, than uh, chance. For the verifiable event um, that occurred, the, the, our controls are at zero, and the um, potential HSAM subjects are at about 80%. When they're asked for an autobiographical e event, which we uh, could not check at that time, uh, the, uh, the HSAMs are at about 75%, and the controls way down. And if you look at the total average across there, it's about 75 80% versus 10%. These, these are huge differences. These are not uh, slight differences. Uh, it's almost either have the ability or you don't. It's, it's that different when you're working with the, these extremes. Now then, we uh, pursued the autobiographical memory a little bit differently. We asked them to tell us things that we could verify. The first day at the university, the first day of elementary school, their 18th birthday celebration, the address of the first place they lived after leaving their parents, the last final exam in college, and we had to get verification for the HSAM subjects. Now we're asking something which we can verify by looking at records. The HSAM subjects gave 145 details which were verified. The controls gave only 24 details which we could not verify. So that's the clear difference between them. So here's some, here's some characteristics that uh, I've put up here for you. They are highly accurate in autobiographical remembering. Not perfect, not perfect, but they're highly accurate. They're slower to forget. We did another experiment in which we gave them some experiences and then we measured their retention, their memory of the experiences that we gave them. Now, the controls are just like these people for 24 hours. Or put it another way, 24 hours after an experience, our memory is as good as theirs. So that's at their very best, they're like us for 24 hours. Then sadly, we begin to forget and they don't. So the way I like to put it is, they are, they are not good learners, they are bad forgetters. They simply forget slowly, and we forget rapidly, and that's the basis of the difference. So they're not magical learners of anything. They're, they're not super learners. As a matter of fact, in laboratory experiments, they're generally no better than controls in learning laboratory material. But in the real life situations, they remember well for 24 hours, as we do, and then we gradually forget, and they forget if at all, very slowly. That's a basic thing. Um, the, uh, one feature that they all appear to have in common is compulsiveness, obsessive compulsiveness, both by them telling us what they do, and I'll give you a couple of examples, but um, also on tests that we give them. There are tests that measure obsessive compulsiveness, and they are significantly higher on that scale in comparison with our controls, and we think that that may ultimately turn out to provide a clue. We don't know what that clue is yet, but we uh, do know that they are different. What are the signs of compulsiveness? Well, some of them 
report, and we saw it happen, that if they draw something, drop something on the floor, it has to be washed before they touch it. Um, one of the reports, he's very careful not to drop his keys getting into in his apartment because if he drops the keys, they have to be washed before he can use them again. Uh, he doesn't wear shoelaces because shoelaces touch the ground and the ground has germs on it, so he's very careful. So germ avoidance is, is one of them, uh, and it takes different forms. Another one, when I was interviewing him, I looked over and, uh, and I asked him to tell me something about him, and he said, well, I do have this, and he reached over and he grabbed a napkin. He says, I carry this with me because you can never tell who's touched the object before you. And so when he goes to a restaurant, he takes his own napkin so he can handle the salt shaker and the pepper shaker and all of that because you can't be too careful. And so he's germ avoidance. Uh, one of our subjects, who is a Hollywood actress, Mary Lou Henner, um, is um, a, an organizational person. The first time I met her, she came into my office, stood in the doorway. Now, if you saw my, well, you saw my office because the twins were being interviewed in my office. It's relatively neat, you know, there's nothing terribly messy. But she stood in the doorway like this and she said, well, I could organize your office in 15 minutes. <laughs> and I wanted to say, hello, could we be introduced? You know, those were her first words to me. She wants to organize. And I found out later that she has as a hobby uh, organizing the, the the closets of her friends. So, uh, and her own, her own closet is organized in terms of last worn, date of purchase, and she does that for all of her dresses and for all of her shoes. Everything has to be in a tidy thing. Now, she's a wonderful person. She's very sweet and jovial and all the rest, but she does have this organizational thing. All of our subjects have something like that, and there's got to be a link somehow, and we haven't figured out exactly what that is. And finally, there are some differences in brain regions. We have done structural imaging of all of our subjects, and we found a number of brain regions which differ uh, in comparison with uh, age and sex match controls. Um, we, uh, our most interesting one is the uncinate fasciculus, which is a pathway that connects the back part of the brain with the front part of the brain, and it is more active and our subjects uh, as uh, DTI uh, assessment in structural imaging. And so that's of interest and possibly a clue. Um, the uh, hippocampal, parahippocampal gyrus, a region of the brain which is involved in memory, is different in our subjects. And a region of the striatum is also different, and we're interested in this because that's also a region that has been implicated in obsessive compulsiveness. So maybe there is a link there that we can follow up. Uh, we have not done any, any structural uh, imaging, I mean, sorry, any, any functional imaging as yet, but we intend to do that to see what happens when they are asked to remember things. But it's a de delicate problem because it may be that, uh, that what happens when they try to remember something is what we all go through and we try to remember, and that may not be no different in them as a, in comparison with us, but we need to find that out. So here are some questions that face us. Um, memory is, is essential for our survival. We are our memories. That's it. We are our memories. It, it, we're, they're not only our past, but they're our future. We need them in order to get along in life. So why is the ability to have strong memory so rare. Why don't we all have memories like that? I mean, that's a serious question. Evolution made a serious mistake. They left us with miserable memories, and they gave a few people who don't need them very strong memories. So that's a very serious question. Is there a genetic basis of this? Well, we have identical twins, one of whom has the ability and the other one does not. We are rechecking, by the way, to make sure that they are identical twins. We're doing a double check on that, and we're also doing genetic studies, uh, uh, larger stu studies. Um, what can we learn about memory from this? And one question we wonder, um, do they have this ability because they have stronger processes involved in storing and preserving memories? Or do they have mechanisms for retrieving memories which are better. I mean, we all have memories that we can't think of right now, and la later on the answer will pop in. You've all had the tip of the tongue memory problem. You just cannot think of it, and you try very hard, 
and then 20 minutes later it pops into your head. That says the retrieval processes that you set in motion are still working even though you, you're not doing it yourself. The brain is doing it by itself. Do they have better mechanisms in their brains to pull out the information? Notice that they're responding with uh, 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 Louise Owen immediately after the question, just like that. So does she have retrieval mechanisms? I mean, even with something that you and I know very well, we probably would take more than two seconds. And yet she reaches in and grabs it out. And then finally, what are the neurobiological implications? What, what is, suppose we understand a lot of, of the above. Uh, what does it mean for understanding the brain? And is it just the, uh, understanding their brain or is it understanding our brain as well? Um, let me take it to the extreme. You probably all know that some autistic savants have extraordinary memory. Uh, there's this young man in, in the UK who has flown over London, uh, Rome, and uh, uh, Tokyo, and in each case after he was flown over by helicopter, came back and drew the rooftops of the city in remarkably accurate detail, just with one, and he's autistic, one flower. Something's going on in the brain of that individual, which is remarkable, and wouldn't it be interesting to understand the memory processes that enable that kind of memory? It'd be just truly remarkable to understand that. Maybe if we could understand the brains of these people, we would get a remarkable understanding of what our brains can do and what can't and what the mechanism underlying it. So it, it's worthwhile thinking deeply about the implications, but there's obviously a lot of work to be done. And with that, thank you.